Dearest Heavenly Parent, we want to pray to you because we believe you are our real, true parent. That our true parents on earth, Father and Mother Moon, made a Sangwa ceremony so that no one would be left out of heaven. True Father asked us to do this for every person so that they could be welcomed into your kingdom by the grace of our true Father. We thank you. We offer prayer to you as we gather and begin our, our service today for Mrs. Ilda Diaz and for, Miss, for Mrs. Judy Osa. We're going to begin by lighting this holy candle. Please be seated. Okay, we'll begin our service. This is a simple service, nevertheless profound service. So this is our ascension, what we call our ascension ceremony, because we believe ascension is the natural state of being. And I'll explain that based on True Father's words. Now. When I, when I first heard Father's words in Vegas about this, I was so excited. This is, amazing. this is such a wonderful thing. We're going to have a congregational hymn in a second. I'll do an introduction. Uh, opening prayer will be by John Kenny. Uh, I'll do an explanation according to Reverend Moon's words of what an ascension ceremony is. Then we'll have a slideshow biography of Ilda Diaz, uh, invitation of testimonies also for Judy Osa. So let's begin with a hymn called Amazing Grace. John Kenny, you ready? Mm-hmm. This is wise, and we're going to sing uh, one, two, three, three verses, and then John Kenny will offer an invitation. Yeah. 
service this evening. Let's pray together. Mm -hmm. Beloved Heavenly Parent, we thank you very much for this fellowship, for the true parents of mankind, for the divine principle, and this amazing group of people. Our Father has given us a way to celebrate our passing into the next world. That's right. This is not a gloomy occasion. This is not a time to hang our heads, but to celebrate and encourage our departed loved ones to go with speed into the arms of you, our Heavenly Parent. We thank you for this tremendous blessing. Many, many people are in sorrow. Many people commit suicide do terrible things at the death of a loved one, but we've been shown differently. We've been shown a different and new standard of celebration, of joy, of love, and encouragement to release our loved ones into the arms of God. We pray that you can be with us today. We want your presence here in fullness, in fullness, to embrace our loved ones and each other as we lovingly send our friends and relatives on to the next life. Please be with us here this evening. Please be comfortable with us. Enjoy our fellowship and share our joy at allowing our loved ones to ascend. We pray all this upon the name of two parents and the names of every blessed couple present here tonight. Adieu and amen. Adieu, Adieu and amen. amen. Please be seated. Please be seated. With joy and gladness. Okay, I'm Pastor Frank, and we're going to uh, give a brief explanation of our Sun Ra or Ascension Service. 2010, 2010, right? That young that Reverend Moon was how old? Nine, 90, 90 years old? 90 years old. 90 years old. He decided this is towards the end of his life. He wanted to make sure he had, he, this is one gift that he gave us towards the end of his life. Right? He announced a gift, and he called it a gift of our son law Ascension Service. So this is from his words in 2010. He said, ladies and gentlemen, the word death is sacred. It is not a synonym for sadness and suffering. True parents have created the term sunwa, or ascension, to explain the true significance of death. The moment we enter the spirit world should be a time that we enter a world of joy and victory with the fruits born of our lives on earth. It is a time for those of us remaining on earth to send off the departed with joy. It should be a time for great celebration. We should be shedding tears of joy instead of tears of sadness. That is the way of the sacred and noble Sungwa ceremony. The first step the spirit of the departed takes towards enjoying eternal life in attendance of God. Within his embrace, at the moment of our death, our spirit should feel more excited and thrilled than a newlywed, newlywed bride feels when she goes to her groom's home for the first time. Right, ladies? You had to be really excited. In order to open the door for all people to experience this kind of precious eternal life, I held a Sunwa ceremony at the United Nations headquarters in New York on March 18, 2010, in honor of the world leaders who had recently passed to the next world. And then he named off all their names and, uh, and uh, that sort of thing. So let's explain. Uh, Reverend Moon says, we grow through several stages of life in each development, is preparation for the next stage. Here's a, obviously a baby in the womb. Reverend Moon says, we can see that each person's life goes through three stages. Everyone is conceived through the grace of God and the love of his or her parents. The first stage of life is the time, is the nine months spent in the mother's womb. No one is exempt from this, right? Everybody, you got to be born of a mother and father. No one is exempt from this. Whether or not we are conscious of it at the time, all of us, without exception, do spend nine months in our mother's womb. 
there's babies in there. Connected to our mother, we our mother breathes for us, and we get the air through the umbilical cord. We say the baby in the womb is blind to the world outside of the womb. However, baby in the womb is growing eyes. Necessary in the world of air, but of course useless in the womb, right? Can't read anything there. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. My singer. That's right. The baby in the womb is receiving love and nutrients, is growing bones and muscles which would be necessary outside the world of the womb. The baby is growing feet and legs. Again, useless in the womb, right? You don't need any legs in the womb. There's no place to walk. <clears throat> but essential for the world of air. The point is, each stage we're in is preparing us for the next stage, not only just for that moment. Baby is being prepared for the next world beyond its knowledge or capacity to understand. That was Reverend Moon was teaching us our life in this world. <laughs> Jesus said, you know, build up for yourselves treasures in heaven, not on earth. It's the same, same deep meaning. And then, of course, we're born, right? What about our birth into the second stage of our lives, which occurs on earth? How can we find words adequate to describe the struggle of a newborn baby as it is faced with a completely unfamiliar new world? Right? Many times babies cry. Usually all the time. The first lonely cry of a newborn as it experiences a large and wide world that it finds upon exiting the womb also represents the promise of a 100-year future, the blessing and celebration of entering a new time and space. So when the baby's born, we usually celebrate, right? We have balloons, we, we give away candy or gifts, we call our parents, we take pictures, we send pictures all over the world because it's a time to celebrate. Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So when we come to the earth, our first breath is the first breath of life when we actually become a truly human. And there's a little baby love. Parents love, generally speaking, love the child, right? Love the child. So, Reverend Moon says, birth is, birth is that moment of ecstatic joy for the parent. Uh, Matthew 10, also for God, by the way. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So, of course, parents love their kids, right? Who else loves their kids? God loves them. God loves them more than you. You don't count every hair on your kid's hair, right? You count their fingers. You might count their toes. You might see that they're breathing right and they have, you know, mostly they seem okay, right? But God is actually counting every hair on their little heads. So we say God is spirit. That's the Bible. That's the book of John. God made the heavens and the earth, not only the earth. So we're not only designed just to live on the earth, we're also designed to live in heaven, which is a world of love and it's a world of spirit. After 40 years on earth, after the resurrection, Jesus ascended. Where did he go? To outer space? No. Jesus went to the heavenly spirit world called the kingdom of heaven. And that's where Jesus still lives as a life-giving spirit. Right? Jesus says to prepare for the spirit world do not restore up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we want to learn to love God with our whole heart, soul, and mind while we're on earth. And we need to love each other as ourselves. God created us as his children, as the original, absolute, unique, unchanging, eternal being. God created human beings by breathing his love into them to endow them with a soul. So, with, as Reverend Moon was saying, when the child is born, it's a traumatic, frightening exit from the safe, warm world of the mother's womb to the bright lights and openness of the world air, right? Babies cry. Because they, they don't know what's going on. Do you think babies are comfortable in their mother's womb? 
Yeah, I think so. Everybody says they're comfortable. The, they, can, they can hear the heartbeat of their mother that calms them. They hear the blood in her mother's It's warm, always the same temperature. You never get cold like here on Earth, like today, right now. <laughs> so this is similar to our transition to the spirit world. They're true. <laughs> we're afraid of dying, and we're scared to die, but we shouldn't be. That's Reverend Moon's big message. We shouldn't be afraid. When we love our children, our wives, our parents, our deep desires to love them forever. But if everybody lived forever, the earth would be too full to accept more life. So God made another world, an eternal spirit world, and we're without end. Well, we'll be together with our family, our loved ones, our friends, in love forever. And you don't have to pay a mortgage there. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. Jesus taught us, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you I am going there to prepare a place for you. I love that. I want to go to that place. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know, you know the way to the place where I am going. Right? 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He, is, he was put to death in body, but is made alive in the spirit, just like we'll be made alive in the spirit. We don't want to live in this old body forever, getting older, bolder, fatter. No. <laughs> Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. So where is it? It's his God, Jesus' kingdom is the spirit world, the kingdom of heaven. 50, Corinthians 15 45, the first man became a man of the earth, but the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So Jesus is the spirit form of Ruth. This is one of the most important ones. This is one of the most important ones, at the ascension of Jesus. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and, and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem with what? Great joy. With great joy. This is the meaning of the ascension ceremony. They weren't sad anymore. Number one, they understood that Jesus' ascension after the death is great. It's great, and they're going to be going there to heaven too. So we don't have to be sad. We should be happy, and we should be exhilarated, and we should be full of joy, right? And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple praising God, which we should do too, right here in our own sanctuary. So we always talk about the spirit world, that this physical life on earth is only temporary, but our life in the spirit world, with God's love, good vitality elements, and loving others, then we're going to transition someday to be just pure spirit, just like Jesus did, just like our ancestors did. So mother's womb is necessary and valuable to life, but it's only temporary. While you're in it, you need to grow, same with our spirit bodies and our physical bodies. We need our physical body temporarily to get vitality elements to feed our spirit body to we can, so that we can express true love to God. Right? You say sometimes it's like a, a potted plant in a pot. It needs an earlier pot to grow. So again, we say each stage of life is preparation for the next stage. We grow through three stages of life, and each development is preparation for the next stage. So our life on earth, in our earthly tense, is also only temporary, only quite temporary. Thank you. Corinthians 15, 48, as was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth, and as it is the man from heaven, so also those who are of heaven, meaning us. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. So Jesus became a life-giving spirit. Then likewise, we must also become a life-giving spirit. Great, thank you. He says, I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does a perishable inherit the imperishable. So this is a good thing. So Elder Diaz I, is entering the kingdom of heaven. And uh, Judy Osa. So I'm a mystical Christian. I feel very close to the spirit world many times, and I don't doubt it. In fact, St. Paul says, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, 
which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing, which is us. Is that right? Right. So here's Reverend words again. The moment we enter the spirit world should be a time that we enter a world of joy and victory with the fruits born of our lives on earth. That's what treasures in heaven mean. We love people, we love God, we make effort, we sacrifice, we, we go out of our way to serve other people. That's treasures in heaven. It is a time for those of us remaining on earth to send off the departed with joy. It should be a time for great celebration. We should be shedding tears of joy instead of tears of sadness. That is the way of the sacred and noble Sama ceremony. The first step the spirit of the departed takes towards enjoying eternal life and attendance of God within his embrace. At that moment of death, our spirit should feel more excited and thrilled than a newlywed bride feels when she goes to her groom's home for this first time. In order to open the door for all people to experience this kind of precious eternal life, I held a Sama ceremony at the United Nations headquarters in New York on March 18, 2010, in honor of the world leaders who had recently passed into the next world. And that's what we're doing today. That first, we explain the word of God. Next, we're going to be doing sharing a life course of our loved ones. We're going to, we're going to begin with Ilda Diaz. Is Maria Kenny going to be reading or showing the pictures? John Kenny will be doing that. And then after that, we're going to be hearing from Bob Millar about uh, Miss, Mrs. 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 Judy Osa. Osa. John Kenny? Okay. It's all yours. Let me make sure the mic's on. And I hope this works. Check two. I missed on this side. Thank you, sir. I don't know. The left. <laughs> Never. Oh, I have no idea if I'm in the. I hope I'm in the uh, thing here. Well, Frankly, I, um, I never met Ilda, and I didn't realize the relationship that Maria had with Ilda Diaz. We put her picture up here every Sunday right. morning to pray for her for a long, long time. I think she had cancer before I did in 2017, and she's been up and down, in and out with this, and finally it took her, unfortunately. Um, so we appealed to her daughter, Laura, uh, for uh, the best bio she could possibly send us. It took us a long time to translate it. <laughs> it took the better part of today to translate it and get it down to uh, one, one page of, of, of the most important events uh, in her life. So uh, I'll go through this uh, very quickly. Her entire name is actually Ilda de Concepcion Garcia Diaz Ribafeta. Yeah. Uh, Ilda was born on December 8th 1947, here's her parents, were de Jose Domingos and Palmira yeah, uh, Diaz. Uh, she was born into a family of two brothers and three sisters. Uh, they lived in a small town, this is coming, <clears throat> and be, uh, she had to begin working at the age of 12, helping neighbors take care of children, cleaning and walking them to school. She really enjoyed studying, especially Portuguese history, and could have been a teacher but could not pursue her studies because she needed to continue working to support her family. Later, as an adult, she went back and finished her elementary school education. This is actually very common in Portugal because it's a, it's a really farming country and a fishing country. Even my wife had to be, was pulled out of school to help with the farm. They, they, they didn't have enough hands to take care of everything. They grew everything, all the fruits, all the vegetables, raised all the animals, everything from hand. I was there when her mother was making bread. In a, in the, and the, the father made an oven right there, next, built onto the house out of bricks and yeah. rock. And, and she would just make bread and she'd go up on the road and sell the bread. I mean, we're talking back country. It was, it was really amazing, actually. But this is not uncommon that uh, young girls would be pulled out of school to help, help out with farm work. A relative of the family uh, she was taken care of in Portugal lived in Mozambique, which at the time was a Portuguese colony. Portuguese had a lot of colonies around the world, and this was one of them. And, um, uh, and this, this, this lady here needed uh, care. You're, uh, let's see, you're, you're, 
but the pointer? No, the mid central oh, is the pointer. There we go. Okay. <laughs> this nice lady here needed care. Now, this is uh, Ilda and Luisa. Lu uh, Ilda had a sister, Luisa. And here's how the story goes. Um, Ilda's older sister, Luisa, had nursing training and was asked to go to Mozambique to take, to take care of her. Uh, even though Ilda's family had a son, Manuel, who was already in Mozambique in military service, they did not want Luisa go alone to take care of her, even though the, the brother was there already in the military. Uh, so, uh, at 16 years of age, Ilda was asked to accompany her, and then they went together. This family promised that they would take care of the sisters as if they were their own family, and they did just that. Apparently, they took care of them just as though they were their, their own daughters. It was really, really something. Uh, let's see, right side. Oh, I'm doing this. There we go. Uh, so this is, these are, now th these are the children uh, of, yeah, that she was taking care of. And that's Ilda <coughs> right there. And there they are again, Ilda and uh, Luisa in Mozambique. Uh, she lived in Mozambique for 10 years and met her future husband, Alexander, through her brother, Manuel. She married in 1969. They had two children, Laura and Sergio. Luisa married as well and had two sons. Ilda was very happy, apparently. Let me uh, do this. But always missed her birthplace, Portugal. She was happy in Mozambique. It wasn't a, at the time, it wasn't a bad place to, to live. It gets rough after this, but... <laughs> Uh, she, but she always missed her birthplace of Portugal. In 1974, very interesting thing happens. There was a bloodless coup d'etat in Portugal uh, with kind of subversive elements demanding release of all Portuguese colonies, including Mozambique. That includes Angola and s several other provinces, all kinds of different places. At the same time, there was a growing communist insurgency in Mozambique, and subsequent war destroyed the country, destroyed the country and forced the Portuguese to leave. So Luisa returned to Portugal with her children, followed shortly by Ilda. Both their husbands had to remain behind temporarily to take care of affairs in relation to the release of the colony. There still, there was, uh, Portugal was very heavily invested in Mozambique, and there was a lot of loose ends to tie up, even though the thing was falling apart. There was things they had to do before they could themselves could go back to Portugal. So the ladies and the children went, <laughs> shows you how bad it was. They sent the ladies and children, the women and children first, Back to Portugal, the men stayed. In case it really gets rough, the men will take care of business, right? So, uh, and uh, it was very difficult for them, both of them, to restart their lives in Portugal. And there's, there's Maria here. That's Maria? Way, way back. This is in the 70s, right? Yeah. yeah. This is, now she's known Ilda and Luisa long before she met the church. This is way before the church, and, and yeah, that's Maria there, and that's, that's uh, Ilda right there. This is Laura, right? This is Laura, her daughter? Yeah. This is Maria in the garden, and uh, Ilda took that picture, right? that beautiful woman in the garden? I don't know. I, boy, there must be a, quite a striking gentleman waiting in the wings for that one. <laughs> Yeah, Ilda's parents-in-law's house. And then this is Ilda, her son Sergio, Laura. Yeah, this is Sergio here. Oh, that's Sergio, right? Well, I, th I got ahead of myself here a little bit. Uh, in 1975, Maria was working at a hospital close to Lisbon, actually a little bit f uh, southeast, where four members of Ilda's family were working, including Ilda and Luisa. So Ilda and Luisa and two other of their family members were already working in this hospital. Uh, they became good friends when Maria finally met the church in 1982. Her spiritual mother, uh, Moritana Figur, was working at that hospital as well. Witness to my wife, then my wife witnessed to them, uh, who were working at the hospital as well. She successfully brought Ilda and her daughter to the church in, in uh, 1982. Uh, let's see how our pictures are. Yeah, there's the gang right there. 
<laughs> There's Maria, yeah, well you Hilda, come Laura, you Sergio. Come to the hospital to start the work. The mother was there already, and Luisa was there already, and the older sister was there already. Hilda was the last one to, to mm -hmm. join us. It's Ilda. It's Ilda and her daughter, Laura. And Laura's on the phone with uh, Maria almost every day now. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so there's Laura and Sergio, her very handsome husband. <laughs> Striking gentleman. Sergio is, is, is Ilda's son. Uh, no, um, no, that, no, no. Laura and Sergio. brother and sister. Yeah. This is brother and sister here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. That's yeah, right. That's why I, think it's I think there's a couple of Sergios in here. But the main Sergio is the son of Elza Diaz. Yeah, right, yeah, so right, right. right. Son, yeah, yeah. That's how it works. Sorry, Portugal. <laughs> this is going to Portugal when we're that done. Is, uh, this is Sergio's children. children. Good looking little brood. That's that Sergio's that children? That is. Uh, so they're grandchildren. Yeah. This is uh, Ilda grandchildren. Yeah. Sergio yeah. Son, uh, Hilda's son's children. Yeah. And this is the whole this family. Hilda and brothers and sisters. This is her mother and all of her brothers and sisters. And the mother. Right. And the mother. Three sisters and two brothers. Yeah. That's when she started getting sick. And uh, was sick in 2017, Hilda was diagnosed with gallbladder cancer. She fought very courageously to overcome her misfortune and ultimately passed at 72 on December 28th, 2019. Yeah, here's, oh, she's, uh, she's under treatment. Happy? Yeah, she's under treatment at this point. But with a smile on her face. Amazing. Yeah, Maria's been telling me that she was, we, she was known for being a very sensitive, very wonderful person. Even if people talked about her or backbit her, she always gave goodness back. It was just a, an amazing spirit. And there's her, uh, that's, that's, that, that's Sergio. That's Sergio, yeah. This is getting close to the end there. And uh, so, so Portugal didn't do a Sungwa for some reason we still can't figure out why, but Sorry, Portugal. But they, they, did, they did kind of a send-off and, and a commemoration, and this was the beginning of it. Some kind of ceremony, I don't understand what kind of ceremony. I send the message, I don't see that. Sorry. But uh, this is Laura oh, giving her testimony. Yeah, it was uh, well attended. Yeah, some kind of ceremony. I this is, this is did what people call a funeral. <laughs> we do an ascension. Yeah. Well, this is, a, this is a church center. There's a, Liberto Silva was a state leader, a national leader for quite a while. Really nice guy. I met him years ago and very, very sweet uh, gentleman. Really nice guy. And I think that's it. There you have it. Thank you. There's that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We're going we're gonna to say a prayer to the ascension. R, one, Father's words. What is, what is the meaning of this? Two, words. When we say words about these people, they're a witness. They're a witness to their judgment. Right? We're witnesses to their goodness, their good deeds, their good life. We're witnessing, we're making a witness to God, to the spirit world, and also to all the evil world. This, these, these are good people. That's why the testimony is very important. That's why the testimony is very important. Because all of us have to have an advocate in our corner on Judgment Day. You want to have an advocate who truly loves you to give your biography and say all your good things so that uh, it will be a witness to all the whole world. So next we're going to do, uh, uh, sorry, got her name wrong there. But Mrs. Uh, Judy Ola. Osa. Osa, sorry, I apologize. <laughs> Well, th the problem is I did this before you sent me a picture. Anyhow, we know who she is, right? So, Bob Millar is going to give a, a testimony. Uh, shortly after I joined the church, well, a few months after I joined the church, they had a workshop for parents mm. in Berkeley. And my 
parents came and my sister. My parents had to go somewhere. They didn't say the whole thing, but my sister stayed for the whole thing. And she had a really good experience. She was like a member after one day. It was like amazing. She's very open, very warm kind of person, and she just really relates well to people. People really like her easily. And she wanted to go to a workshop, but we could never work it out because she was working down here and everything. In fact, she was um, manager of a bank in, in uh, Solana Beach or up there somewhere. And um, that was the year the Padres won the pennant and they were going to go to the World Series. And she got to throw out the ball at the last game of the year where there's really? this completely full out. <laughs> so somehow just, it was her turn, I don't know, because of being in that bank and everything. Anyway, it turns out my sister at one point joined AA. I had no idea she had a drinking problem, none whatsoever. Anyway, um, her, her daughter told me that she thinks that my sister became an alcoholic so she could join AA and counsel people because she was like unbelievable counselor for a long time because this was like when she was about maybe 30 or 32, I don't know how old. I mean, and she never, you know, drank again after, after that, but she counseled hundreds of people, literally, and um, was very successful at it and really liked it. And she never believed in God, I think, until she joined AA, which is like kind of a very big, big part of AA, actually. And um, one thing she's... As far as me joining the church, she's like been very supportive of our family, and she's always like I'm just blown away by our kids how well they did and how great they are, how beautiful they are. They <laughs> are. She's always making comments about our family and our kids and everything else. And um, she was doing quilting. You know what quilting is? Sure. You know, Maria, you know what quilt, quilt making quilts. She did that anyway. Very hard to do, and she's very artistic, so she made some beautiful quilts. And the, the quilting organization did a lot of uh, quilts for for people who were they're not adopted, but what do they call them when you a family takes you in? Foster, 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 foster children? children. Yeah, they did made quilts for foster children and did lots of things to help foster children, things like that. And her husband is. Um, he was a, he's a Basque shepherd, actually. He actually raised sheep when he was a child and ended up in the Sierras and Marysville and stuff. His family is Basque, mm -hmm. part of Spain. Mm -hmm. And um, he's a very strong Catholic, so my sister became a Catholic, which kind of really shocked me. <laughs> that was her second husband, by the way. Um, and uh, they really participate in the church a lot, especially her husband is always doing things. And they mm. brought them. There's a really big Catholic church there with a very well known minister or the priest, I guess. They had them over all the time. So she made lots of friends that way and helped the, and helped the church quite a bit there. Very big Catholic church. And at her funeral, because of her activities counseling people, and the church and the quilting. There were so many people. It was like unbelievable. There's hundreds of people there. Mm -hmm. And she was really loved by everybody. It was like amazing. And she was like, like I say, an excellent counselor. And um, even when jo and when I was painting one time from my, my sister lived up in the Bay Area, well, way near Sacramento, with her husband there. And Josh and Naomi came to visit us when I was painting one time over there. That's when they were going to school at Berkeley or I think it was, I think, still in college there. And after getting to know my sister for a couple of days, Josh said he felt closer to my sister than he did to his own blood, you know, aunts and uncles and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That's just the kind of person she was. People just really liked her. Even, well, she was the favorite, my favorite person in our family. And I think everybody felt, my brother felt the same way too about her. So, um, you know, she's really, very, just really, they got a good sense of humor, really warm, and just really good with people, they were just really natural with people and stuff, so. This is her son, by the way. Mm -hmm. He lives in San Diego, and her daughter lives in Montana. 
So yeah, when I, I, when I was, before my dad passed away for you, you know, I was, when I would think of something, I would always want to think of something to share with my dad or ask my dad about something. You know, just, you know what I'm talking about? If it's someone you're really close to and you want to always think about them when you, in reference to what you're doing. After my dad passed away, I felt the same way with my sister. I was always when something special happened, I wanted to tell her about it, talk to her about it. Mm -hmm. There was a question about that. We really had a good relationship and got along well. And she was very positive toward the church, positive toward our family especially. So she was really, really a loss for me. Okay, that's it. Osa. O-S-E? No, I think it means a bear. Osa is a bear, isn't it? Osa is a bear. My kids really, really liked her a lot, too. I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, I remember she came. She didn't just come to... Uh, to this, right? She came to a, a Christmas party one time, didn't she? My mother came to some stuff. Yeah, oh, maybe it was your mom. She was a great uh, dessert maker. Huh? <laughs> your mom. Yeah. She was great at making desserts. Okay, yeah. so, so this is the conclusion. As pastor, I'm going to offer a prayer for her ascension, uh, for Judy uh, Osa's ascension, and for Ilda Dia's ascension. So why don't we rise? Let's have an attitude of prayer. Because this is a calling on the Heavenly Parent to welcome a Judy and Hilda to the Kingdom of Heaven. Okay, let's bow together. Can we? Pray together. Dearest Heavenly Parent, we want to pray to you and, re and rejoice in your true love and promises of Jesus and her true parents that we'll never be orphans again. We have a place that Jesus and her true parents have prepared for us in the spirit world and that your angels will gather the spirit of Ilda Il Diaz and Judy Osa to your King of Heaven to be preparing an opportunity for our families to come together eventually to live in peace and joy in your true love. We thank you, Father, and the authority as the blessed central couples assembled here who have been serving our true parents, serving your will for most of our lives under the promises and authority of our true Father who made the Son love, as he said, so that everyone can ascend. Everyone who participates in this ascends to your kingdom of heaven. We thank you for your grace, kindness. We thank you for the indemnity conditions that our true Father paid to make this possible. For all the blood, sweat, tears, sacrifice, and effort to make for this joyous ascension that we can feel comfortable and confident that our friends, our family members, and eventually ourselves will all be together in your eternal peace kingdom. We thank you, Father. We want to close our prayer now, having confidence and comfort and joy, Heavenly Father, in this ascension ceremony. We thank you, offer prayers to you, upholding the name of our true parents, that in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, in our own name, is this blessed center of couples. Adieu and amen. Adieu. Adieu and amen. God bless you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Time for snacks. You're welcome. Thank true parents. True parents did all this. True parents made it possible. That's right. They're getting ready for us someday.